first I want to start with why this is important, um, not even when talking about cisness and transness, but providing us, providing sanctuary for black women is important. You know, we see the, the memes all the time telling us to get rest, telling us to live a soft life, telling us to take breaks, telling us to, you know, do all of these things that even still we don't fully have the power to access in that way. You know what I'm saying? So I think it is important to create space, but even at bare minimum, you know, I could just go to the beach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And look at the waves. And, you know, that might be something that is simple, but, you know, like, that is not something that a lot of black women have access to, to rest, to unplug um, in these ways. And that there's, there's privilege in that. So I think it's important that when we're saying that, when we're screaming, taking that rest, blah, 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 that we're creating space for people to actually do that. So this is, like, one of the... Actually, the only time I've had someone provide, hey, this is a place where you are going to be, you know, sis and trans are going to come together and, like, rest mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, build community and, you know, whatever, but not not um, not work. Right. And I think that's important. Like, when do we get to do that? So I wanted to start there. Making sure that the interactions between cis and trans women are safe. And natural and organic because like you said earlier you know this mad I don't particularly like the word ally um, because I feel like when you are the more privileged person in a space even th though your intention is to always you know do the best things because of your privilege you don't always see all of the ways in which you can be harmful to somebody else Mm -hmm. So that's why I generally, you know, that's the general language. Right. But how how ally can you how how back good of an ally can you be if there are still systems that make it so that your life you have more access in your life because of just simply how you were born, you know, like right. shit like that. Right. Um. So I think it is important to prioritize safety in that because, like, we could. Um, like, I'll just use this example. So, me and Janice have been friends for forever, do our podcast forever. Um, and for the most, you know, we're both cis people, blah, 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 blah. But she's a light skinned person. So, that girl loves me down to the ground, right? Mm -hmm. But because of the way the system is set up, there's going to be a way that she harms me that she didn't even intentionally right. mean to do. But that's just the world we live in. Mm -hmm. So, for me, um, I'm always thinking about that when I'm in a space with someone, especially when I'm in spaces with trans women, because I, regardless, I don't care how much I'm down for whatever, because of the way the system is set up. Right. <laughs> you know, that's just what it is. So I'm always trying to like make sure I'm thinking of safety in those ways. But that's why I also think it's important for it to be a natural occurrence, because if it's not then it becomes performative and it's like are you mm -hmm. doing it or is it just right you know so you could get the funding or is it just so you could look like you're doing whatever on social media you know so on and so forth mm -hmm. so i think it's really important for the coalition work because there are way more similarities and differences but even if there are differences so the fuck what right those differences are created for systems that have nothing to do with us mm -hmm. you know um so yeah, that's why this is important. This has been fun. I've never been who I need. So this is amazing. Um, being on the beach. This this is great. This is right. Great. Yeah. The food's been good. The drinks been good. You know. Yeah. yeah it's, it's been a really really good time. I think the the best thing for me having to be on this trip and just the way that this composed is that we haven't. Since I've been here, we haven't had to have a conversation about our transness and cisness. We've just been able so, to yeah. show up and um, be and just have fun with each other, yeah. laugh with each other, eat with each other, go on the Uber rides or the fries with each other, which is an experience. And I, I just think, particularly with like what each of us does for a living, mm -hmm. it's good to kind of not have to to just be in a space that's not related to work. Yeah. or a conference where mm -hmm. we have to kind of 
like pathologize ourselves with. Like yes. we really, and especially like as a black woman and femmes, we we, we there's some type of like labor yeah. that that is associated with us getting to travel that. I appreciate that I could just come here and I have to plan to go to a session or not have to plan to be on a panel. I can just really um, be and like not even really ask y'all what y'all do, just be in a space. Yeah. And like we're the only black women on this resort. So like we just <laughs> yeah. get to kind of like be in a space and be in this bubble and just heal, rest, go to the beach, take a nap if you need to take a nap yes. and just like. What I tell people all the time, particularly with, like, cis people that want to trans friend or want to, like, create relationships or, like, have questions, like, I always tell, like, you probably not going to be friends with me because if you just ask me to come up and be your friend, like, I'm just not that type of person. Like, if I want to be your friend, I'm probably going to, like let you know but like mm -hmm. when you're trying to do like the quota diversity thing it's probably not going to work with me <laughs> but i tell people all the time if you're in like for me if you're like in like sisterhood or relationship with me all of that information will come out because i'll feel comfortable yeah, to tell you or just exactly. like stuff will happen and exactly. i'll just be like girl yep. you know this stuff will be the insurance and like you'll know and like it does, it doesn't have to be this conversation or this diversity like one hundred and one. And I just like appreciate like we're just in a space, just like being us, doing us, Letting existing, it just sort of organically, right? Happen, and right? it's not like well, you have to do a survey to get the gift <laughs> card. And it's like no, I don't like I'm on I'm in Hawaii. I'm on vacation. I just want to to be here and like not be surveilled in that way yeah. and just um it's just it's just important for like it's important for us so that the work that we can go back to the work that we do energize mm -hmm. um even more focused exactly. and really and really knowing like the impact of the work that we do because a lot of us are contemporaries mm -hmm. so just being able to share space in this way it's just it's so important and I think it should be bigger. I think more people should come. I, you know, different people should come and just have this experience just to be and to be together. Yeah, yeah. And to eat really, really, really nice food. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say that, like, we're actually who needs a retreat. Like, the world is how <laughs> we need a retreat. So, mm -hmm. yeah, this is this is great. Yeah. Yeah. Currently, is um, kind of just really like delving into myself, um, heavily into grooming. I didn't realize how I always thought grooming was just um, something I just was used to doing. Mm -hmm. Not ritual that I needed, but ritual that was like, you gotta be clean. So, you know, like stuff like that. Right. But during the pandemic, when I wasn't able to get my nails done and pedicures and um, had to learn how to do my own facials or whatever, the things that I used to like to do because I do like to be I like to be groomed by other people mm -hmm. um so even if it's not a professional like I'd rather someone else cut my nails you know like I don't know I just like kind of um that thing so I just did a lot of that for myself also decorating my apartment um it did allow me to look around and like assess what I want the apartment of my dreams to look like so I've been like Really, really creating just like a visual of you know, it's like my little my little sanctuary kind of thing. So that's been like on a personal level, and then I'm saying the joy on a communal level is like deeper connections with everyone that I love. I did get a lot closer to everyone, like my friends, um, my family, and with intention more so than just like. And I'm thinking in terms of the pandemic. Pandemic. So the pandemic made it so that a lot of the things that brought family together and friends together, we couldn't really do, right. especially in New York City, because it was shut down more so than other cities in the country. So it was like you had to make an effort to like make sure I call this person every week because I don't know when I'm gonna see them. You know, just stuff like that. Um, so being able to be better at intimacy in terms of friendship and family was really really good for me and a joy for you so over the pandemic my health has been uh 
I'm not gonna say a struggle, but it's it's caused me to put a lot of things into um, perspective. So of course, as everybody gained weight during like the, that first wave of the yeah. pandemic and was kind of eating crazy, but then it got to a point where. I gained a lot of weight and I, I was starting to have like different complications. So I had to get to a point where, um, one, I came to terms with myself as somebody that is pre diabetic mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. navigating through the stigma of that and kind of getting to the, the place of the goal for me is to be healthy. The goal for me is to be in control of myself. The goal for me is to value myself. So, me not kind of facing these things is not going to get me to where I want to be if I want to like have a long and healthy life. Also prioritizing my mental health in a way. So um, I was able to get like a formal diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I was able to get on medication. Um, and it was a way for me to kind of really reclaim myself and not use work or use things as a distraction and really kind of um, sit down with myself and interrogate why am I feeling this way? Do I want to continue feeling this way? Um, trying to get to a place where I felt vulnerable enough, but also feeling empowered enough to connect with um, people so I could get the help that I needed. Um, I feel so much more in con uh, control of my health now in a way that I don't think I've ever um, felt before. And for the first time in a long time, I'm, I don't feel like I'm just living life day to day. I, I actually feel like I'm in a position where I'm making plans to be here and live like a long and healthy life, like whatever that looks like, whatever size I am. And, you know, it's not really about a size for me. It's about um, taking the steps that I need to take in order to live a more healthy and a more fulfilling life. If that involves me taking some medication, mm -hmm. that's fine. There's nothing wrong with um, yeah. taking medication. That's what it's here for. Yeah. Um, it's here for in kind of like undoing like that cultural thing where I don't want to, if I, if I have diabetes, then I'm fat and then I'm a fail. It's just like, no, some people are just genetically or we're just more in a position. I happen to naturally like sweet stuff. That's just I'm how my, saying, that's just yeah. how my palate is. Yeah. So, you know, my A1C is going to be a little higher, but that, that's okay. They have medication for that. Yeah. And just getting over the stigma and getting the stuff that I need so I can just, um, be in control of my health and I just um, prioritizing my health in that way, prioritizing rest, making sure that um, I feel like more than anything, I listen to my body now in a way that I just maybe I was distracted before or maybe, but um, and also prior to the pandemic I was diagnosed with um, cancer um, primary B cell lymphoma so I think going through that before the pandemic and then when the pandemic started, I was kind of, I was like a year or two out of, um, you know, my last chemo session. So mm -hmm. I was kind of already on the path of reevaluating like what my relationship with my body um, looked like and felt like. And I feel like now more than ever, um, I listen to my body more and I trust my body and I don't try to just physically and mentally and I try to really take account of what my limits are and um, vocalizing when I can't do something or when I don't want to yeah. do something and just feeling comfortable with that and really letting my nose be my nose and really trusting myself in a way that I think I hadn't um, before. So yeah. When you say, when you talk about trusting your body and listening to your body, it because um, I'm very into like listening to myself but when you say that it makes me think about all the times you do listen to yourself and the world tells you something different or you tell your doctor i feel a certain way and you're like oh girl, you know if you just you know you know the bullshit right, right. <laughs> be telling us so i like that you decided like no i'm gonna get back to me and be center myself i listen to myself because i'm sure there was a point in your life where you did I mean, people probably made you feel like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You're not qualified to say A, B, C, D, you know. And a lot of it was really myself I, because I didn't want to be the quote-unquote statistic or Got I just it. didn't want the stigma 
of being labeled crazy or being labeled yeah. fat because yeah. you know I, I'm going to get diabetes and I'm gonna have to get something empty. Like I didn't want that stigma, but. Ultimately, it's that stigma that keeps us away from the yes. interventions, which yeah. will pro mm -hmm. um, longer lives. And also, I think about it culturally, like as a black people, especially like black women, just how like historically we have, from slavery we have been taught to deny our body, just yes. like on the because it didn't belong spiritual, to us. right? Yeah, and just how that manifests like in our family and our like pathology particularly with like our parents who like work 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 to their right. detriment and i'm always thinking about contextualizing that like honoring that that's what they had to do but that that's not going to work for me now yeah, and that's exactly. okay yeah, 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 yeah. so sisterhood for me has manifested in my life in many different ways so i have many sisters biological sisters um, so I always had kind of a built-in support system in that way. And I do think having so many sisters has been helpful in like two things in the, in the sisterships that I create outside of biological whatever. But it has allowed me to understand like differences because none of us are the same. Mm -hmm. We grew up in the same house, had the same rules, you know, whatever, but we are all very different. So it has allowed me to, when I seek sister sisterhood or whatever, I do want diversity in that. Like, we don't look the same. We don't think the same. You know, like, you know, there's right. probably a common thread, obviously, which usually is the case with family. There is, like, a common kind of cloth. So I do look seek that. But I do want to be around people who can, I can learn from, um, who are comfortable learning from me, too. Um, which is, you know, we, we've experienced it when people don't like learning from other people. Right. So I I appreciate that. And then the other thing I learned because I already <clears throat> had like a biological sisterhood was to also, I guess, kind of be conditional with who comes in and out of my life. Um, and I didn't know that I was... I didn't have the language of it, but I've always been kind of conditional with stuff. Like, um, yeah, I just have a standard for like how I'm gonna be your friend, right? I have right. that standard for myself, right. <laughs> standard for how you know, you know, stuff like that. So I have been able to like not, I guess, follow the crowd or not feel like I have to do things a certain way because everyone in the group does because I think. Since I already came from a group, I was always okay with being an individual. I don't know if that makes any sense, but mm -hmm. I've always been kind of like, oh, well, y'all could do that. Um, you know, it, it always allowed me to, like, be in a collective, but still always kind of, like, just be myself right. in a way, which, was, which I think is helpful, which I think keeps me genuine, which I think also makes me still be genuine to the people around me because I still have, like, a footing with who I am in that. Um, and I think it allows for a, like a reciprocal kind of balanced relationship with the people that I'm in community with, at least, you know, I hope, <laughs> yeah, you know, you never know. Um, so that's been helpful. And then I think I learned a lot about sisterhood from the growing up in the mosque, um, that I went to where it was, I think that's where I learned is that black woman is all I got mm -hmm. and we all we got, you know, like. I think that's what I really, really learned and saw black women kind of like, yes, we are, you know, in community with black men or whatever, but we are we got. Right. <laughs> and that's kind of like, that's the first place where I saw that. And where black women told me it was okay to think that way, that we all we got. Because a lot of times you're, you're told you're being divisive or reductive to a black community if you don't see if, if you don't pay if you act like the harm doesn't happen from you know black women and stuff like that so those are a lot of the ways that i've interacted with sisterhood why it's been important to me sisterhood has protected me from a lot of things sisterhood has taught me so much there's so much i did not have to experience mm -hmm. because other people was like girl don't hold on that block you know just like which is 
which is great. Um, so yeah, so that's like me and my relationship with sisterhood. It's definitely going to be different because <laughs> I'm an only child. Um, but sisterhood, how I learned sisterhood is just looking at the relationship my mother had with her group of girlfriends and um, her um, biological sisters and. My mom was never the one that, she's not like a caddy, like a, mm-hmm. she's the type of person, if you're her friend, she's your friend to the end, she's going to be supportive of you, so I kind of, you know, had that model to me, mm-hmm. like just how to show up as a, a sister friend, a sister girlfriend, um, prior to my transition, I was always the little boy that had the um, group of like, cis woman girlfriends. Mm-hmm. I I, I kind of experienced like a sisterhood with them prior to my transition mm-hmm. because they were the ones that, you know, shielded me from like the homophobia or, you know, I was the the, the one quote unquote boy that hung out with, with the group of girls. I was the one that would, when we were in high school, I would just walk into the girls' bathroom with them while we were in conversation and mm-hmm. it wouldn't like be an issue because... And they would always slip up and be like, girl, girl, because that was just the energy of our interaction. Yeah. Even before I transitioned, that was kind of how we bonded. And even with me transitioning, um, my friends from high school, I'm still in relationship with them. I, I'm still, and it's, you know, nothing has changed except, you know, my physical, but um, I got to experience um, it with this woman that way. And then... Um, as far as trans sisterhood, when I came into my transition, you know, I was lucky enough to have a relationship with my trans mother, um, who was, like, from the ballroom scene from um, New York in the 90s. And um, she had her group of sisters who she still had relationships with, a host of daughters and um, nieces. And I was fortunate to be able to come into my transition with this whole community of black and brown trans women that um, welcomed me in. And that too gave me something to model what I wanted my relationship with other mm-hmm. trans women of color to be. So that was, and, and now I, kind of, I went through a lot of ups and downs when it came to the, to the black trans girls, but you know, ultimately the right people um, fell yeah. into place. And I, I, I think of myself as, the girls girl like I get along with any like black trans girl cause I, I'm not the like I I crave I need that type of connection cause it's just something when you're able to be in relationships with somebody and some conversations are just unspoken because there's a knowing yeah. um, I have certain relationships with my um, sisters where we finish each other's sentences um, when we're explaining situations mm-hmm. and we just, there's just a no one and, you know, that, that level of intimacy, that level of deepness, it's, um, you can't buy that, um, you know, it's life-saving, it's um, necessary, um, and, you know, it's just something that I'm always um, wanting to experience and I'm always um, wanting to um, be around, um, and I also think that my relationship with other like black trans women in this part, phase of my life with my mother it's encouraged me to kind of build that with my mom, mm-hmm. especially as I um, know her and experience her as a woman. Yeah. And I just want I want the closeness with us to just be honest, being like mother and daughter. Like I actually want to um, get to know you so we can so you can call me, I can call you, and we can we can just have that deeper. Um, level of intimacy and I can really bring you into my world because earlier in my transition when she wasn't able to like be a supportive there I kind of pushed her away I kind of it that was my defense mechanism but it just led to a lot of lost time and now I'm trying to kind of um gain that back and I don't think it's for like selfish or petty reasons it's like, I feel like I'm a great person. I feel like my mom is a great person. And why not? Like, why yeah. not have that relationship? Why not um, Why not allow us just to be, now that I see her as a woman and I can, like, recognize, like, the systems and the experience that made my mother the woman 
who may, how they, those things made her the woman that she was to me, being a mother and that who she is now. Mm-hmm. I think being in sisterhood has allowed me to offer a level of grace to black cis women um, that I might have, I may not have been had the capacity capacity to demonstrate in my younger years, yeah. but I definitely can do that um, now. Like one of the most important things to me as a woman. Just feeling safe. Like, when I close my eyes and, you know, I really think about it, I've really felt the most safe in the presence of other women. Yeah, um, And even now, as I begin my legal career, you know, women, um, cis black women have, um, cis black women, straight, queer, have been the ones that have kind of rallied around me to kind of, you know, protect me and take me to the next level. So it's really with the women where I find um, safety and um, elevation and um, nurturing. So, you know, I'm always looking to just curate that and um, give that out to folks. So yeah, sisterhood is very important to me. Yeah, so I like that you brought up sisterhood with your mom, and I never thought of the friendship that I'm built. I have a friendship with my mother now, right. which is, like, like my mom is cool as fuck, so I like that we have this friendship, and I never really thought to call it sisterhood, but that's actually what I'm building right now with my mother. Like, I never thought that I would be one of her little friends, but now I'm <laughs> one of her little friends. Like, she's calling me to be like, you know what this, you know what this woman did at work today? Right. You know, that type of stuff, which I just... Never imagined. I remember. I remember calling my mother at work as a kid for a pop chart, and it was like, "Girl, why are you calling me out?" You know, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. And now we're like friends, um, and we go out. You, what you doing this week? You want to go out to eat? In, like in ways that I just never imagined. Um, me and my mother bonding and getting to know her as. Like, not my mom, but as, like, a woman who's lived a life, who's experienced things, who can now talk to me in ways she couldn't before. So, because it's not just about, you know, like, I see that she trusts the woman that I am. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, and she loves the woman that I am. Because I think that's important, too. Um, and we, we just kind of connect on this way that I just never expected like to the point where i'm like asking her questions because i want to make sure that um she's so at this point I, I know i have older people in my family but i do but like i'm talking to her about menopause because i want to know what the fuck is my pussy gonna do <laughs> <laughs> you know you just like right, right. what's gonna happen what's going you know this just these things that i never thought that I would, like, because she didn't really explain my, my period to me. I had older sisters who did. Mm-hmm. So let me at least do this with my mom. Right. You know, um, and have these conversations that she was honestly too scared to have with me, but I'm not too scared to have with her. So let's just, you know, talk about it. Um, and I, I really like that I can, like, talk to her about those things and stuff like that. So, yeah, it is a sisterhood, and I like that you, you know, named it that. Yeah, I remember when um, I think I hit I, my my dad. I, I think I've talked about this in that very first episode of March, like the very first one, Daddy's mm-hmm. Lessons. And when she was when she clocked that he was being shady to me, and she had took on the responsibility of pushing my dad out of out of my life because mm-hmm. she I didn't because she literally just said, "Oh, he was faggot, so I don't want him to first my son." That's literally how she took it. She didn't give me details because I was twelve. Yeah, but once. She's seen I'm grown, and he's still being how she remembered him. She was like, all right, now it's time for me to be. Tell you the thing. Now you're a grown woman. That's the thing, too. Mm-hmm. I learned about my biological father more. Because when um, I was raised by my mother, my stepdad, um, who's my dad. But my mother never spoke about my biological father. I just knew the name because he was on the birth certificate. Same, same. But she never spoke about that man because she's just like... I do like the fact that my mother was wanted me to form my own opinion, I guess. So she just never mentioned that man. Then when I was older and he was starting to reach out, she's like, do, do you want to meet him? I'm like, I got a dad. I'm fine. You know, like I didn't, whatever. So when I, as an adult, when I do finally interact with this man and he's trying to paint this picture of my mother, I'm like, uh, my mother never said not a word about you. So you're telling me everything I need to know about you. Like, you ain't shit. Like... Mm-hmm. <laughs> Also, like, yeah. you're, you're, you're like my mother didn't even have to tell me. As this. yeah, <laughs> as as I've like 
recontextualizes like concept of my mother as a mm-hmm. woman and because I used to have a lot of anger towards, so I never met my, my my biological father. I just know the name on the birth certificate. Never seen no pictures, never. And crazy, I actually did an ancestry test, like just trying to see the like other half of my family. And I believe my father um, passed like in two thousand because they send you hints, and based on the name and the information, is like. They had the death indexes, and you know the name was yeah. coming, and it would make sense because mm-hmm. I've never um, heard anything from him. But and I used to hold like when I was like in my teenage years, you know, when you had those questions, I was very angry mm-hmm. with my mom, and I just had resentment. But as I've just had, and she told me the story of he just a typical deadbeat, and then after I was born. Um, he came up to the hospital and said, who's who's my son calling daddy? And she said, nobody. And she said she just never heard from him again. Mm. So, and, you know, that made me angry in my adolescence. But me experiencing men and just how ancient men, yeah. how ancient men can be. And sometimes you just can't help who you come across and just how unreliable men are. Just yeah. in my experiences as a woman and just like... I let a lot of that shit go because you just can't, you can't help who you lay with. You can't. And I was able to just let that go and appreciate, even though I do have a lot of answers about that other side of me. Mm-hmm. It's never a situation, even though my, my father, he may have died in like the early 2000s. Yeah. My mom has been working at the same place since before I was born. So that's even the, before that yeah, time, that's the thing if he wanted to reach out and be in a relationship with her or have a relationship with me, that could have happened, but it didn't. I'm having, but I was just able to have so much compassion for her because, like, niggas ain't shit. Like, niggas, not. like, and I've come, and I understand. Really like, yeah. if I was a cis woman, I might have been in the same situation coming across the same ain't shit. So, I was just able to just let that go and stop right. judging her and stop blaming her and just appreciate her for what she was able to do because my mother is like, like, when you think about, like, she's the type of mother that even though. We are, I'm an adult and, you know, we have our woman-to-woman relationship yeah. now. It feels good to hear from her because I know I get my mother feels from, because she really loves being a mother. Mm-hmm. And, like, I know everybody doesn't have that. So it made me, me coming into my womanhood, me wanting to have that sisterhood with her as two grown women. Um, It really allowed me to appreciate the mother that she was able to be to me. Even through all of the bullshit that yeah. she had to navigate yeah. as a black single woman. You know what she makes me think of? So I remember a conversation I had with my mother. And she was like, all this access you have to abortions and birth control pills, I didn't have that. So like you like you really didn't have a choice of who was fathering your, your, right. your, ch- your child outside of who you had sex with. She was like, I didn't have these choices. I was pregnant. I was just pregnant. And then I just had to, you know, because right. um, I guess she didn't have, you know, access to the underground market. <laughs> <laughs> but she's like, I didn't have these choices you have. And she's like, I'm happy you have these choices. Mm-hmm. But like, it's, it just, to me, it just speaks to how our mothers didn't really have choices. Right. You know, you with somebody, he's ain't shit, and you happen to get pregnant because... You know, all it takes is a sperm and an egg. Right. <laughs> right. And then now the whole trajectory of your life is just, like different. And then these men, like my biological father knew I, my, he is the person who helped my mother get the apartment that I grew up in. Mm. And I lived there until I was 19. So you knew my address my whole life. Right. <laughs> like, so you made a decision. And for me as an, as an adult, when it all came together and it all made sense and I had all of these pieces, I'm like, yo, my mother really did her thing to not mm-hmm. say anything horrible about this person because I have a lot horrible to say. And, and, my, mom, and my mom didn't even, she didn't even put him on child support. She could, because she was, her thing was, I'm not going to beg you to do mm-hmm. what you should do. Mm-hmm. And, and and now looking at, back at how much my mom actually made and like we had, a, how, like, I just, like, I can barely do it now. And I'm making way more than my, my, my mom ever. So I just, I can never fathom yeah, yeah, how I she was able to. And one thing my mom always impressed on me, it's not about attaining things. It's about ma- how you maintain the things that you have. 
and like looking at like what she earned when she, at her work, I just I just don't know how she did it, mm-hmm. and it was just me. Mm-hmm. And everybody and everybody in our family used to think that we were so rich and what and it's like no we actually weren't but my mom she's a Virgo to the core so it's going it's going to be a rhyme and a reason and mm-hmm. it's going to uh, make sense and I you know that is still um, deeply deeply in me so as a black woman we don't have a lot of agency over our body even when Roe vs Wade was the law of the land, right? Because mm-hmm. I still could go to the hospital and try to give birth and I die. I can still go to the hospital and say, there's a pain here and they're like, you're good, here's an aspirin. Right. They like saying, you know, I have an aneurysm and I'm not, you know, there's just so much that we already don't have control over our bodies because of the state or whatever like that. I just wish that we could get to a point where we don't have to be resilient. I'm tired of that shit. <laughs> like mm-hmm. I'm tired of being here in spite of right. <laughs> I still made it you know like so I, I, I love black people in a way that we are able to survive I just I we're doing the work so that we could thrive but it is really difficult when it's at a snap of a finger someone can say you can have an abortion someone can say you cannot transition someone can say you don't have the right to you know like right. like right just <laughs> like i just snap up a finger and i don't have any control over that so it's it's difficult to navigate your personal joy the how much you love being black and free in the spaces you pay for yourself mm-hmm. but then outside as soon as you leave that bubble <laughs> It's the world, you know? So I, I'm at a place right now where I'm trying to figure out how do I exist in that? How do I um, lovingly exist in that? Because it's really easy to turn bitter and cold when that is, you know, the case. So I'm trying to really figure that out. Like, what does that look like for me now that um, I'm grateful to be in a state where it won't affect me greatly in that way, but as I learn more, like most black people live in the South. Right. This is going to affect black people in so so many ways, even when it comes to a lot of the laws that they are changing as far as trans folks. If most black people live in the South, then most black trans people live in the South. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's just like... The idea I was trying to convince <laughs> one of my previous employers and... That's another conversation, but yeah. <laughs> it's easy to forget because it's just so, so much shit that I'm using the word distraction, but it's, these are actual things, so they're not actual distractions. It's all that comes to my mind now. But it's like if you're always fighting, if you're always proving you deserve something, right. if you're always trying to convince somebody, you know, this is my womb or whatever the fuck, right. when do you like get to like actually live the freedom? Because mm-hmm. you spend so much time Proving you deserve, you know, it's just, it's annoying. <laughs> it's annoying. For me, as crazy as things are, and they have been like over the past five, four to five years, particularly with the, the reproductive justice conversation, I am excited and I am inspired about the ways how we can like really coalition bill amongst each other, particularly with cis women mm-hmm. um, and trans people that are, like, impacted yes. by, like, just, like, reproductive rights and bodily autonomy and just, like, really link arms and come together because so many times, it, like, from my vantage point or my perspective, like, when it's, tra- like, when it's trans stuff in the headlines or it's, like, the trans post on the shade room about should your child be able to transition, yeah. should your... And you see so many uh, black folks in the comments advocating, well, they shouldn't be able to do that, that should be illegal, da da da, da. and then for it to turn around and be abortion, which impacts everybody, I think it, it just hammers it hammers home how like all of our liberation is linked together. And yeah. the people on the Republican side, like they are like they are multifaceted, they have multi approach, but we literally exist or work in organizations where 
this is only a racial organization or this is only a, a LGBTQ organization and this is only a women's organization and I've worked inside some of these organizations when you try to you you try to hammer home the importance of having an intersectional approach yeah. or, and they just look at you like they watch your paint drop well you know this is outside of the funding or we can't really do, but it's ultimately going to impact all of us. Like so it should be this multifaceted issue, but on our side we haven't been able to gather and that to me that's is why the is why we're in the position that we're in and now we're having to like reach across the aisle in crisis, but we should we should have been practicing that anyway. So that when we, when it comes time for the attack we're not now just yeah, now being exactly. in conversation yeah. or reaching out. Yeah. I already know what's going on because I'm talking to you every day. I know what's important to you. And I'm valuing the most marginalized people. And I'm I'm already I already know what's going on. So I while it's unfortunate that this is happening. Yes. I think it's a wake wake up call for everybody that thinks that they're um, progressive to, to let them know like not even on a political level, but on a personal level, who's in your circle? Like who? Like mm-hmm. who are you building sisterhood with? Yeah, yeah. Who are you building sisterhood with? Where you thought that they could just attack trans folks, and you thought they weren't coming for cis people? That's the thing that really blew mine when when Roe versus Wade was overturned. How quickly everyone just got transphobic, and it was like, wait, what? <laughs> like. They didn't do it. <laughs> like, were y'all not paying yeah, attention were, for the past, like, four years? It was like, all of those justices were cis people. Like, what, like, who made this decision? And everybody just got transphobic in ways that was just, like, weird. Like, everyone's just questioning language now. Um, I always notice, anytime people are talking about anything or reproductive justice for cis women, that they just always start yelling at trans women. And I'm like, like yeah, this is like, like the time. Like they not like, even. Like, like, yeah. How did I get yeah, in this? Exactly. How did I get in this? Like, <laughs> I'm like, damn. I'm like, I'm, I'm literally tweeted like, like, please this, show me the trans <laughs> justice <laughs> that wrote that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that wrote like, the, like, please let me know. Every single time, and it's just always like, what the fuck is wrong with y'all? Even people who are less ignorant to the trans experience. I've kind of, um, there was a lot of people just talking about like, oh, well, since we can't, um, I'm talking in the very cis, if we can't fucking get abortions, then we should start, can they the start to, yes, we should start, the, and I'm like, that's still not body autonomy, right. if you're forcing people to get vasectomies, like, how, right. how are we, like, what are y'all doing? So sometimes I think people are just be mad and screaming into the void and not really thinking about what the fuck they're saying. Because, like, why would your automatic thing be to, like, jump to vasectomies? And in my mind, I'm like, if they are saying that I can't say when I, if I want to abort as a cis person who has a privilege in the space, right? Mm -hmm. You think they wouldn't just forcefully give vasectomies to non-binary people and trans women because they are deciding how we're supposed to fucking mm-hmm. bring life into... Like, it was just... It's, I don't know. It was just like... And that's what they used to do. That's a unit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, They yes. would force gay people to get castrated because they they wanted them to protect their harems and not get people pregnant because the bloodline yeah, was so like important. Yeah, like, sterilization, for- forced sterilization is a thing in the United States. Right. So it was just weird to me that we see body autonomy being taken away and then the rallying crowd was less body it was I don't know it was just I didn't get it I didn't get where why like why are we yelling at trans women when they are literally right. minding their business in this moment it was, it was just a really wild couple of weeks when that shit overturned it, yeah it just yeah it just showed how it showed like just how on a micro level that a lot of people are people who like to paint themselves with the ally brush are not yes at, really yes. in community yeah with, people other than their own experience and whenever you have to start something i'm not transphobic but right. it's like it's just like can, can we just stop here but again i think 
we had there has to be a more concerted effort to build like real relationships yes, with yes. each other so that we're all privy to this because somebody that's in a relationship with me I would have been able to express the concern about the overturning of Roe v. Wade and also been able to discuss how it impacts me and how I how I move but these are things that you only get when you're in ten, when you choose to be in intentional relationships with people yeah. that exist outside your um, own side so we have a lot of work to, it can be done that's part of the reason why I wanted to move to the south because even though um things aren't the best this is it's a certain type it's a certain it's a movement that's happening yeah. in the south now mm-hmm. it's a certain energy in the south there are a lot of black people in the south and i always believe in black people yeah. like we you know i just have to and i kind of want to assist to be a part of whatever that ch- there's a reclamation coming and they're scared they're yeah. they're scared yeah. but mm-hmm. and it's not even racial like this younger generation they're like I, I had the opportunity to, to um, do like educational law and work with the youth, mm-hmm. and these younger generations, they're not here for the shit. Yeah, they're not. And it, in the next twenty to thirty years, it's just going to be. I'm not going to say everything is going to be resolved, but we have come so far in such a short amount of time, and that's why they're trying to keep things the same. Because the beauty of the internet is we've been able to kind of create these communities yeah. um, where without the internet, there were just so many social barriers. People are able to exchange like information and really coalition build. And like the people that are empowered, they are so scared. That's why they're doing all of this yeah. crazy shit. Yeah. And these, these young kids, they not, they don't, they don't give a fuck about none of this shit. Yeah. 